Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a monsoon update after damaging storms rolled through the valley last night. Also tonight, increasing talk of major light rail expansion, and the owner of a clothing company is giving more than the shirt off his back to help those with special needs. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Heavy rains hit the valley last night, resulting in flooding, downed trees, and over a dozen water rescues of stranded motorists. Joining us now is Nancy Selover, the state climatologist and a resident of an area near South Mountain that was hit especially hard. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, what did you see? You're up by South Mountain, correct? Yes. yes. What did you see last night? Um, we had uh, an extreme rainfall event that was tropical moisture. Um, we had some, some dynamics. It was a very unstable atmosphere and everything came together to squeeze that water out. And we had 3.37 uh, inches at my house in 100 minutes. Three point, how was what, 3.37? Yes. Three and a third in about an, a little over an hour and a half? Yes. Uh, I was going to ask if this is typical, what happened last night. That doesn't sound typical. No, that's not typical. So what, what was the difference? What happened here? Um, we just had uh, an incredible amount of moisture that had come up from Mexico, and it was really tropical moisture. So we saw very clo uh, low cloud levels, and it didn't take much to raise that up and get, that, get those, uh, those rain events to start happening. And it just sat over South Mountain for an extended period of time. And was the orographic lifting involved there at all? There was or? some orographic lifting. There was certainly some surface heating. Um, there was also some dynamics. There was a, what we call an inverted trough, a low pressure system, and some additional um, positive vorticity or spinning that helps uh, cause uplift of the air. So I was going to ask, it, it seemed like it kind of parked over South Mountain, but it came from Mexico. Did, it, did On the entire trek up here, could you see it building? Was it kind of waxing and waning? The, the weather service knew the moisture was up there. Um, the storms themselves, a single storm doesn't form down in Mexico and, and typically continue just as one storm. It's just a continual reformation of a storm cell. One will die out and the next one will form. So, and, and, and it forms in Mexico, moves up here in various forms, as you say. This one parked over South Mountain and just went nuts on your house in that area out there where they stranded motorists and everything. Where does the, where does a system like this go? How far north does it go? Um, this one didn't go too terribly far past South Mountain and kind of fell apart. Um, there was a little redevelopment and sunny slope later in the day and a little bit of formation over the West Valley um, as it went north. But it really dumped its load on South Mountain and so there wasn't enough moisture left after that to really to provide too much rainfall. Is that what happens? Monsoon in storms in general, we, we see them coming up from Mexico. They seem like they bounce off the rim and come back or they go straight up. How far, again, do, I mean, they don't go to Canada, for goodness sakes. How far north do they go? No. Uh, the mon monsoon moisture typically goes into northern Arizona. Um, if we get uh, a storm or, or, a, or a system that moves up the Colorado River, the lower Colorado River Valley, it'll go up through uh, into Las Vegas and it'll dump a bunch of precipitation on them up there. And it doesn't usually, the moisture doesn't usually go much further north than that. Okay, so uh, obviously this was, and you said uh, what happened on South Mountain could legitimately be described as a once in a thousand year event? Yes, based on the annual return interval um, from the uh, NOAA Atlas 14 precipitation frequency. Uh, tables, yes. So basically the fact that it parked on the mountain, not, not necessarily the, the, the amount of moisture in the storm, just that it stopped right there and dumped. Yes, the, the tables are calculated based on how long a time uh, it rains and how much rain falls in that time. So you can have, uh, if you had two inches in 10 minutes, that would be a very, very significant event, something you would not anticipate happening frequently. Um, in this case, uh, we had a 200 year event if I just looked at 10 minute precipitation, the, the yeah. highest 10 minute value. But looking at the highest 50 minute value um, and the highest um, 90 minute or two hour value, we were at a thousand year event. And we were looking at washes. I think these were around your house and, and the washes by, uh, Something like this will change the nature of the landscape, won't it? It absolutely will. When you get that, because it's very steep terrain up there, and when you get that water that falls that quickly, it doesn't infiltrate. So it just runs off the surface. And as it moves, it gains power and steam. More and more water comes down, and it's able to pick up and carry larger and larger particles. Pretty soon it's carrying gravel and rocks and things like that. And then it's ripping trees out. 
um, and carrying limbs and bushes down. And then when it gets to the end of the wash, for example, in our neighborhood, we have culverts that go under the street um, to drain the wash. So the culverts are about three and a half foot in diameter, but they have a grating on them. Well, the bottom part of the culvert got filled with mud and sand, but then the top part was blocked when all these bushes and branches and things came down and blocked it. So the water came up over the wash, out of the wash, over the street, down on the other side of the street and started scouring out the dirt over there. And so, so the, the concept of cleaning up after the storm, yeah, you got to clean up. You also got to look at what's changed and start preparing for the next storm. Sure. Sure, we have to clean out the washes and get those things unblocked so yeah. that the water stays where it's supposed to stay. The, uh, the monsoon so far, uh, this is, uh, other than this, obviously, <laughs> other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how'd you like to play? But other than this, pretty typical, you think? Um, it, it, so far, it has been pretty normal. Um, Sky Harbor at this year, this year is kind of the, the donut hole. Uh, Tucson Airport last year was a donut hole. They had a lot of rain in Tucson, but not at the airport. And, 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 and this year, uh, the airport here has not yet had its rainfall. I think it still will before the end of the monsoon. So you think the monsoon still has some punch left in it? Oh, yes. We've got another four weeks or so. Another four weeks, and that would be not so unusual? No. Does it seem to you, and I've been here a long time, you've been here a long time, it seemed like in the old days, the east side, east valley, eastern parts of areas would always get the rain, and you'd feel kind of sorry for the folks, almost even like in, in the west valley, they wouldn't get the storms, they wouldn't get the rain. It seems like they're getting a lot of storms these days. Is that just me, or what's going on here? Um, it partly depends on, on where that moisture and where the core of the monsoon sets up in Mexico. If sometimes it's over to the east side, so the southeastern part of Arizona gets that, or the, or the storms go up through uh, western New Mexico. And some years, the, the, the central uh, path is up the lower Colorado River, um, and then sometimes it's just up through central Arizona. And so. Where in Phoenix that splits? Does it is it the East Valley? Is it the West Valley? It's it's always hard to say. And it's not there's not a pattern. It's not just creeping in one direction. Right. Okay. So we're not seeing necessarily. No, it's we're just not seeing a trend. Maybe there's more people out there, and more people are saying it's raining out. <laughs> They're here. noticing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, before we let you go, we got to talk about El Nino, El Nina, uh, La Nina. What's going on for this winter? What are you seeing? Um, it's been coming and going and and on again, off again. Um, at the moment, it still looks like it's it will have something. It's looking like it might be moderate to weak not necessarily strong, although that keeps changing. So it's really hard to say. If, if it is a moderate um, El Nino, then we typically would get a little more precipitation in the winter than, than we usually get. Um, and the past three winters have been consecutively dry, so yeah. we're happy for anything. So even a moderate El Nino is a good thing. What does that mean for like the mountains up in Colorado so we can get some of that? Uh Mm, that's not doesn't make so much difference. Colorado doesn't does the, the El Nino is typically the southern tier of states that, yeah. that provide us with more moisture than normal. Colorado and Northern California, they don't usually get a huge, huge impact from it. Yeah, because so. you worry about that Colorado yeah. River water. Yeah. You just kind of worry what's happening yeah. up there in the mountains. It's kind of yeah. hard to tell though. Yeah. Well, the good news for us was last year it was our third consecutive dry year in the state, but um, Colorado, the Rockies got a lot of precipitation. They had a lot of snowpack, and so that helped bring Powell and meet up a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say. That's, Not huge. Yeah, but. yeah, that's still a major concern. All right, well, we'll batten down the hatches and keep an eye on this guy. Good to have you here. Okay, thank you.
City of Phoenix wants to triple light rail over the next 30 years. The city has formed a committee to look into light rail expansion along with street and bus service improvements. Here with more on the plans is Phoenix City Councilwoman Thelda Williams. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, Citizens Committee formed, again, the focus here is on expansion, light rail, bus service, street. How much of expansion are we talking here? Uh, we're hoping a, a lot everywhere. Uh, we're hoping we come up with maybe a 30-year plan that we could actually get the light rail not only to Metro Center in the north, uh, west on Camelback, hopefully connect with Glendale, get it out to the arena down central, and ideally, if the economy approves, we could get clear to Paradise Valley Mall. Are now, are, I want to get to some of those lines in, in particular in a second here, but are those lines approved by anything or anyone, or are those just uh, plans that have been are somewhat in concrete? Well, actually, the um, Metro design is, is underway. Uh, Camelback going out uh, around the Capitol and out Camelback, that one is on the books, ready to go. Okay. And south of uh, Down Central is just in the preliminary stages. Let's, let's go to these one by one. We'll start with the one. It looks like it's going from Chris Town to Metro Center, that kind of general. I think there's the, there's the map there. This would start in 2016 and end, what, in uh, 2026, something like that? Well, that's what it's on the books for, and I'm very optimistic it would be much quicker than that. Yeah, maybe, t uh, although I read somewhere it could, may not even start till 2023 until some of that money starts coming in. Well, it depends, uh, yeah, on the funding and the Fed funding. So. Another one would go from downtown uh, west out to the Capitol and then along I-10. How far along is Actually, that? Actually, it's going to go, I think that, that is no longer going to be Oh, I it's changed it's already. It's changed. Uh, I-10 didn't work for many reasons, uh, and it probably will go across Camelback in some fashion. So, okay, so what we're looking at here may not be the, the, the end result. Uh, across, what would, how would it go straight north then? How would it, I don't understand. Kind of winds around to, to get up north. Uh, that had uh, so many problems, and it was going to be so much more expensive uh, that they abandoned that plan. But it still would go out to the capital. Around the capital north and then west. Okay, north up maybe 19th Avenue, perhaps? Uh, General it, it, Yeah, possible. it kind of winds. Okay, all right. Well, wait till it happens. Another one is 19th Avenue west to uh, maybe like past maybe Grand Canyon University and then on out right. to Glendale, as you right. mentioned. Uh, that one's got a good chance? Oh, I, yes, absolutely. And another one would uh, follow, as you mentioned, maybe the State Route 51 up to Paradise Valley Mall? Well, that's a possibility. That alignment hasn't been studied yet. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic. You know, Dunlap uh, has a, could go not only west to oh, I see. Uh, yeah. Metro, but it could go east and go up like Cave Creek Road. And there's right away there. We could get there. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one you mentioned was downtown. That would be south along Central to Baseline. That, what's, what's the deal with that one? Uh, that one's just beginning uh, under study. Uh, it takes, you know, you have to go through the all different studies, the environmental, set the routes, do all the analysis, uh, and then cost figures before we could get approved. Let's so. talk about some of those cost figures. How much funding needed? Give us a ballpark figure here. Oh, we're probably talking a billion. A billion. Um, We've spent 1.4 billion on the 20 miles that we constructed right now. And this would be? And this is more than that. Yeah. Um, where would the money come from? It's hopefully we're going to have to go out and get the 22,000 uh, tax renewed. And we are optimistic that the voters are going to approve that. We can use that money uh, and begin construction. But I think if, if we had five tenths or six tenths of a cent, then we are able not only to do that, but then we could address the bus. Mm -hmm. We have poor bus service, let's face it. Uh, and we have so many street repairs, and we could actually provide uh, resurfacing of a lot of streets. Now, the current voter-approved sales tax, that ends in 2020, correct? correct. And isn't that, that's four-tenths of a percent on the right. dollar. And so you're thinking maybe go to the voters next year, perhaps with five or six-tenths of a percent? Uh, that's what I'm hoping. Yes. That this committee will come back, because what happened to us is, you know, the, the economy, when it tanked, mm -hmm. Revenue didn't come in, and so what we expected to have built didn't happen because of that. What if the voters say no? Is there a plan B, C, D, or E? Well, not yet. Not yet. Uh, the states 
transportation tax uh, expires shortly after ours. Uh, that would probably give us the money to operate the current system, but it couldn't be, we couldn't be expanding. Yeah, it, it, from what I saw, it sounds like uh, only five miles could be built in the next six years before that, uh, the existing tax. Five miles, that's not a whole heck of it's a nothing. lot. Yeah. And, and good luck with bus and, and uh, street service. Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's a public, $130 million, is that what it is, a shortfall in the public transit system program? Oh, in the transit system? Transit doesn't pay for itself. Yeah. But cash-wise, it never will. It's never designed to. When you stop and think, um, the infrastructure is very expensive. The operation is expensive, but we give so many discounts on tickets. I mean, your veterans, schools, uh, companies, different corporations buy at a different rate. We discount so many tickets um, because we want the ridership. EPA requires we keep our air so clean. Uh, it keeps traffic off the street. Uh, makes a lot of people in my district happy when you get those cars out of, out of their ways when they're coming downtown. So there's advantages that we pay for when we subsidize it. And you do need to get some committed funds, I think, to operating costs in oh, order yeah. to get those federal dollars. I mean, the federal money is not going to come unless there's a plan in place. Exactly. And, and unless we have it in place early. We can't wait until 2018, 2019. Uh, it's too late because they program out their funds. And we all know they have less funds, it's more competitive. So we have to have our package ready, we have to get in there early to be a, a legitimate candidate to get, receive federal money. And that's what this committee is designed to do, is to get to, who's on this committee anyway? Well, we're lucky, it's, it's, it's a real mixed bag. We have uh, former Secretary of Transportation, Mary Peters, and Marty Schultz, who has been involved in transportation in any Anywhere you look at yeah. Arizona are the co-chairs. And then we have uh, people who are interested. We have uh, transportation people from other areas and just citizens from our districts. As far, yeah, I was gonna ask about resident input. What, what, do you, oh, yeah. what do you need there and how can folks just say, here, I got an idea, it's a pothole in front of my street, let's get it fixed. Oh, we get lots of calls on those <laughs> every day. <laughs> but you do. <laughs> uh, well, we are setting up a web page I think it's talktransportation.com, if I recall right. I just heard I about it. I think it might be dot .org or, or dot .org. Yeah, talktransportation.org, yes, yes. yeah. is that what? okay. And once um, they've had a couple meetings, we'll be going out to the community for input, and we welcome it. We want people involved. And, it's, and, and I, I know that when people do get involved, you're gonna hear a lot about bus service, and you mm -hmm. are gonna hear a lot about street improvement. Is there anything in general that you're looking at right now that the city wants to focus on? We hear a lot about light rail, but what about that bus service, and what about improving those streets? Oh, I think it's, they're essential. There are already recognized over $500 million of street repairs we need. Hmm. 500 million, that's a lot of money that we don't have. And it's only gonna get worse. I mean, that's everything from your residential streets. But when you stop and think, um, it's not just the arterials, the main streets, but it's all of them. And we have over 5,000 miles of streets in the yeah. city of Phoenix that should be on a 20 year maintenance schedule that are on a 40 some maintenance schedule. It's no wonder they're falling apart. Well, we'll see what the committee comes up with and we'll see what kind of input you get from residents. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at a Phoenix man who's found a unique way to raise money for special needs organizations. Producer Shauna Fisher introduces us to Paper Clouds Apparel, clothing with a purpose. With every t-shirt that's printed, Paper Clouds Apparel is changing lives. What we do is we take artwork that an individual with special needs has created, we transfer that to our, our shirts, hats, and bags, we team up with a different special needs cause every two weeks, and then we sell their artwork on our website, and then for two weeks, 50% of the proceeds go right back to that special needs school cause organization. Robert Thornton started Paper Clouds Apparel after a visit to his parents' house. Robert noticed this drawing on the refrigerator. His mom is a school bus driver for children with special needs. The drawing was made by a little girl on her bus. And I spent the whole entire night just mesmerized by this drawing because it was, it was different, but it was different in a cool way, you know? And so I spent the whole entire night just staring at it. And the next morning I, I woke up and I thought, 
man, that would look pretty cool on a t-shirt. Before long, Robert had the idea for Paper Clouds Apparel. He chose to focus on people with special needs because they're often overlooked by society. You know, for too long, people have treated those with special needs like, like they kind of don't, they want to put them in the corner where they don't have to deal with them and just, you know, but I want to be like, no, like, I want to put you on a pedestal and show you that, that you're talented, you know, that, that you can contribute to society, you know, that you have skills and you need to be appreciated. Paper Clouds Apparel has raised money for dozens of organizations across the country. Not only does Robert showcase drawings made by kids with special needs, he employs adults with special needs in the packaging department. 80 to 93 percent of all adults with special needs are unemployed. You know, and I think that's it's ridiculous. You know, if you if more businesses focused on helping people instead of just the bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, like this world can be a much better place. And Robert is determined to make the world a better place, one t-shirt at a time. I just feel that I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I was brought here to do. You can change the world, you know, you just have to believe in it. It's not going to be easy, you know, but if, if, you, if you're doing the right thing and you, and you work hard at it, you can do whatever you want to do. Paper Clouds Apparel is always looking for new designs. If you know someone who would like to contribute a design, you can visit their website, papercloudsapparel.com. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, hear about a self-driving car developed by students at the U of A and around the country. And we'll hear how new online privacy rules in the European Union could affect you. That's Thursday evening at 5.30 right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.